So picking up where we left off in our discussion of Tang uh, culture, uh, important to remember, right, the, the same people who engaged in cultural activities were also uh, the same bureaucrats, right? These men of letters who were highly versed in Confucianism, who had studied tremendously. There's even kind of an expectation that uh, as a bureaucrat, you would also engage in more cultural activities on the side, like painting or writing poems. Um, and of course, probably the most, maybe the most valued intellectual activity would have been the writing of history, uh, which was, you know, also in a sense uh, tied into your function as a government official, right? Because the idea is you're writing these histories, not simply to know about the past, right? But by looking at, you know, things that happened in the past, you might learn from their mistakes or from what worked in terms of how you practice government today. Uh, and so as during the Han Dynasty, uh, the writing of histories was a very, very pervasive practice during this period. We should note also that uh, scholars and officials during the Tang period were very sympathetic to Buddhism. Uh, and of course, so at the core were the Confucian classics, meaning not just the Analects, right, but also uh, a number of other texts that had been written after the time of Confucius uh, that were considered to constitute kind of the canon of Confucian learning. Uh, probably the two most popular, uh, like more purely artistic practices during this period were landscape painting, uh, and poetry, which was really extremely secular. So regarding landscape painting, uh, really there's no better way to, to kind of illustrate that than to look at some actual landscape paintings. So some of these are pretty old, a, a bit faded, uh, but you can see here uh, pretty much, I mean, it really just is entirely concentrated on, on nature. Uh, sometimes you might have actual uh, figures in the painting, but this kind of reflected their interaction with nature as in the spring outing of the Tang court. Uh, poetry during this period, uh, so even now kind of looking back, considered to be a, a very kind of a high point in the development of Chinese poetry. Uh, Tang poets uh, uh, were, you know, uh, individuals very often influenced by not just Buddhism, but also Taoism. This is evident, for instance, in one of the most famous Tang poets, Li Bo. Uh, who had very strong Taoist leanings, uh, and he's a very, he was like a, a very dynamic individual, kind of famed for his uh, swordsmanship. He was a carouser, you know, meaning someone who liked to party, uh, womanize, and so forth, and he composed up to 20,000 poems, though we only have about uh, 1,800 today of those. Uh, most of them didn't survive, and the poems that he wrote were very powerful and passionate, uh, but also very sensitive to beauty, sometimes uh, fantastical, uh, so, you know, kind of uh, bordering a bit on the surreal. Uh, and according, you know, this is like the perfect ending for someone like Li Bo. According to legend, uh, he met his end when he drowned while drunkenly attempting to embrace the reflection of the moon in a lake. In some ways, his opposite was Du Fu, who was also a very important poet from the Tang period. Uh, but whereas Li Bo kind of, you know, was someone who, you know, had a very optimistic outlook on life and, and you know, clearly embraced life and enjoyed it to the fullest, uh, Du Fu had a much, uh, much sadder story. He came from a literary family uh, and, you know, it really took him a long time to, to really achieve a position as an official. He had wandered for years, impoverished after failing the Metropolitan Exam. When he finally did attain a government job, it was right before the An Lushan Rebellion, uh, and so he ended up suffering uh, because the government was under attack. Uh, and, you know, so a lot of his poetry, you know, whereas Li Bo's poetry was kind of much more, uh, you know, kind of about beauty and everything that's positive in nature and life and so forth, uh, Du Fu's poetry reflected more a sense of compassion for human suffering. Well, that now brings us to the next major dynasty. So we've been looking at the Tang dynasty. We now move to the Song dynasty, who within a fairly short period of time were able to reunify China uh, in 960, with the capital now being located in Kaifeng on the Yellow River. Uh, initially, the Song centered very much in the north. So what we might call the Northern Song would last for about 170 years. Uh, it was lost in 1127, uh, but the Song continued to rule in the south after that from uh, Hangzhou uh, 
uh, and they would carry on until 1279, uh, at which point China was invaded by the Mongols. Uh, so one important development then during the Song Dynasty is kind of a shift of the center of gravity from the north to the south, right? Uh, really up until now, if we're talking about China's cultural development, uh, talking about China in terms of its political administration, so forth, uh, really kind of concentrated in the north. And so now things are kind of moving south. Alongside of this, this there's going to be an agricultural revolution. Uh, so, you know, during this kind of period from the fall of the Tang Dynasty, this kind of uh, short period of fragmentation and the rise of the Song, the aristocracy is just continuing to weaken. Uh, part of this reflects the fact that, uh, you know, basic inheritance custom was that uh, when, when uh, the uh, landlord of a large estate died, he would divide up his estate between all his sons. So, you, you know, over generations, you end up with smaller and smaller estates, so less a source of wealth or influence. And in relation to, to this, many aristocrats begin to move to the capital, where they do come to constitute a metropolitan elite. Uh, but nonetheless, right, I mean, their power bases had initially been in these large landed estates. Uh, and then also with the fall of the Tang, dynasty, uh, many estates that remained were seized by warlords. Uh, so, you know, again, many aristocrats losing out in connection with that. On the other side of things, the situation of the peasants began to improve. For one thing, you had an end of the equal field system, which freed farmers to buy and sell land, right? So if you were a peasant farmer, you now had the chance of actually acquiring more land than would have been allocated to you under the equal field system. Uh, and some of them were able to take advantage of that and become quite wealthy. I mean, that didn't make you an aristocrat, uh, but you were certainly much better off. Uh, they also now uh, provided the opportunity of paying taxes in money instead of grain, uh, which meant that peasants could, you know, develop different kinds of strategies, perhaps selling their grain at profit, uh, and then even after paying taxes, having some left, uh, left over that they could then reinvest and so forth. And finally, conscription ended with the establishment of professional armies, uh, conscription being the draft. Peasants no longer had to serve in the military. They can now devote all their time and energy to their farms. Helping them also would be the development of new technologies that allowed for growing more crops and more frequently, right? So first of all, you had new strains of crops that ripened earlier. This would allow you to actually uh, harvest two crops in a year instead of one, what we call double cropping. Uh, they developed much more effective fertilizers, and you also had water control projects, i.e. irrigation, uh, that allowed for the, uh, the better utilization of more land. And related to this, some farmers would start to focus on commercial crops such as tea and cotton, right? So rather than growing food primarily for consumption, they were growing crops in order to sell it, uh, and in some cases then even having to use some of that profit to buy food for themselves. Nonetheless, this could prove a very effective way of uh, becoming wealthy. Related to this, we're now seeing the development of what we might call a scholarly gentry class, right? This is uh, what you might, you might characterize as uh, wealthy, educated peasants who uh, nonetheless cannot be considered aristocrats, even if in some cases they're equally wealthy. And these individuals become very, very powerful, particularly at the local level. They come to constitute kind of a local elite, uh, certainly at the level of the village, right, where they would pretty much manage affairs there. Uh, but very often gentry families, uh, you know, they, if you had a gentry family, uh, they might have a number of sons, one of whom perhaps showed a kind of intellectual proclivity, who you might then have uh, take the provincial service examination so that he could become part of the kind of bureaucratic hierarchy. And that individual would live in a district seat or market town, a larger community nearby, uh, and would become kind of an intermediary, right? On the one hand, interacting with magistrates, uh, individuals higher up in the hierarchy, uh, you know, in terms of being kind of these Confucian bureaucrats, um, uh, but also uh, still having ties with the village from where they came, right? Whose interests they shared, uh, and whose interests they would promote through their position. Uh, and usually they would also own land in the villages, right? So they kind of constituted this kind of intermediary between individuals higher up in government and people at the more local level. And in connection with all these developments, we start to see the examination system become much more important, meaning that 
uh, individuals coming from the gentry background, right, from non-aristocratic backgrounds, had a much better possibility of becoming bureaucrats, right? Uh, and, you know, so they, they wouldn't, you know, a gentry family might be able to actually afford to give up the labor of his son and to actually pay for their education to prepare for the examination. And connected with this, we're going to see a rise in the number of officials that actually go through the examination system. You might recall that under the tongue, even though in theory you were supposed to go through the examination system, uh, many bureaucrats had actually kind of circumvented that whole system. It was more about who you knew. Only 10% of government officials under the tongue actually went through it, compared to 50% uh, during the Song Dynasty. And we should be clear about this. This examination, uh, or the examinations, regardless of what level of the bureaucracy, right? And so the idea is you would have to take uh, a new examination every time you rose up uh, to the next level. Uh, these are very rigorous examinations. One had to memorize all of the Confucian classics, so not just the Analects, uh, but a number of other sources that came to constitute what, what were known as kind of the Confucian classics. Uh, and then applying what you learn from that to actual problems of government, right? So the idea was, you know, not just knowledge for its own sake, that you actually know how to apply it uh, to the kind of problems you might confront as a government bureaucrat. And again, a large number of these government officials are now coming from the peasantry, i.e. the gentry uh, class, and this sees a weakening of the aristocracy. Uh, which, among other things, does work to the benefit of emperors, right? I mean, so, you know, the aristocracy would have proven, uh, you know, aristocrats proved the biggest threat to the emperor's powers in many ways. Uh, and so they, they're less able to do that now. Uh, individuals coming from the gentry class, on the other hand, uh, are probably going to be more concerned with pleasing the emperor. That is really kind of their pathway to success. So again, during this period, the South is becoming dominant, whereas you know, th throughout much of Chinese history until this point, the North had been kind of the dominant region. Uh, the center of gravity is now in the South, uh, particularly in the Yangtze region, which now has a very large population. Uh, the amount of wealth that the region is generating is great, uh, and it's also kind of a cultural center. So you might say a new center of gravity right in the South. So between 800 and 1100, the population of the region tripled. China's total population now reached 100 million. And the South was producing more riches than the North. Uh, also, uh, much of it in the form of wheat or millet. Uh, but really important here is that it's actually making the South the tax base of the empire. This is where the government is deriving most of its revenue. And then a lot of that wealth being reinvested in the establishment of schools, uh, you know, the schools, of course, are for preparing students for the examination system. So that means many bureaucrats are also coming from the South. And at some point, the government sets regional quotas for the examination system, right, to uh, assure that different regions are adequately represented in government. So the Song is going to be a, uh, a very important period for certain technological developments. This is definitely a period of, you know, where China's culture is flourishing, uh, certainly as much as ever. Uh, some of this is evident in, the, in certain technological developments. We see the development of the abacus, uh, which is used as kind of like a uh, primitive calculator. Uh, the development of gunpowder. This is invented in China, uh, though it's not really going to be applied militarily that much. A little bit for grenades and projectiles, uh, but, the, but the first actual people to apply gunpowder uh, militarily in a major way is going to be the Ottoman Empire. And we'll be looking at that later. Um, and we're also seeing kind of improvements in textiles, and particularly porcelain production. Porcelain becoming a very, very desired commodity from China, uh, even as far away as Europe. And in fact, uh, for a long time, only the Chinese know how to actually produce porcelain. Uh, other developments with respect to song technology, the use of coke and uh, in bellows to heat furnaces, so they're able to actually have hotter furnaces, which leads to superior weapons. The development of the printing press, uh, printing with carved seals. By the mid-song, uh, books are being printed with movable type uh, in fairly large numbers, right? And China also invented paper, so the two kind of go hand in hand. On the whole, the Song Society was extremely secular, uh, and a lot of this... Uh, you know, in part reflected this uh, kind of higher level of wealth. People had money to burn, 
right? So, you know, there's nothing like having disposable wealth to create a kind of consumer society, right? And this is just going to spur on trade as there is this kind of increasing demand for goods. But, you know, in some ways, commodities that are being bought are not just like kind of material commodities. We also see the growth of restaurants, theaters, wine shops, various forms of entertainment that people can spend their money on. And this is really kind of interesting, right? I mean, just, uh, you know, things like restaurants, theaters, wine shops, that's not something you find very often in the pre-modern world. Uh, so in this respect, kind of resembling a bit more the kind of society we live in today. And all of this is definitely a boost for trade. It's kind of, you know, something that then feeds back, you know, into uh, the desire for commodities, right? As it kind of increases wealth and then people have more money to spend, uh, in creating a higher demand for goods, which then is going to spur on trade. Now, we should be clear, most trade uh, in China is between regions, uh, and probably the most important commodities that are moving back and forth are silk and porcelain. But there is foreign trade as well. Uh, you have traders bringing goods from Tibet, Central Asia, and Mongolia. Uh, you might remember that the Silk Road had been somewhat shut down uh, uh, earlier uh, with the, the, uh, the emergence of this new Islamic civilization in the Middle East. Uh, there is a lot of trading going on by sea, however. Chinese merchants actually during this period... Uh, pretty much dominating the sea routes from Japan all the way to Sumatra and what today is Indonesia. Uh, and, you know, so we see, and, and it's funny, there's kind of also a bit of this kind of, uh, what later on will define colonial colonialism uh, in connection with Europe, right, where China is importing raw materials and then exporting finished goods, right? So probably China benefiting from this trade pretty much more than any of the other parties involved. So Song culture, uh, again, as with the Tang, dominated by uh, this kind of educated, uh, educated bureaucrats, but now many of them coming from a gentry background. Uh, the Song dynasty during this period, culture has become more secular. Uh, Buddhism is still important, but not quite as influential as it was during the Tang period. Uh, and in fact, many Confucians, people, uh, officials educated in Confucianism, uh, strongly opposed to Buddhism and Taoism influence. I mean, they're not necessarily against Buddhism, but they don't want to see it influencing their understanding of Confucianism. Uh, in fact, this is what is going to happen, and this actually ties into the, to the assigned reading we have uh, from Ivanhoe. Uh, and finally, we might note that this is a period during which uh, both porcelain and pottery are going to flourish in China. Uh, becomes very popular. And there's, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen, sometimes you see in old movies, uh, you'll have some kind of uh, scholar who is very knowledgeable about Chinese pottery and can identify which period it came from and so forth. So this is when uh, Chinese pottery is really coming to the fore. A few individuals that stand out that we might mention, uh, Sima Huang, uh, a historian who wrote A Comprehensive Mirror for Aid in Government, uh, really tried to produce a comprehensive history of China. Uh, and he was a really proper historian who made very appropriate use of primary sources. Uh, what's kind of interesting, he would often try to explain how he was using them, um, which, you know, uh, really speaks to his rigor uh, uh, as a historian. Probably the most important intellectual from this period is Zhu Xi. Uh, and he is the subject, one of two individuals uh, who are the subject of the uh, reading you've been assigned uh, by Ivanhoe. So Zhu Xi was a Confucian scholar uh, who was very well versed in Taoism and Buddhism. Uh, and even though he kind of uh, argued against allowing Buddhism and Taoism to influence Confucianism, he actually is responsible for introducing many elements of both into Confucianism, the, the beginning of what we call Neo-Confucianism. So for instance, one thing he really emphasized was meditation and uh, pretty much barring from Buddhism in, in this respect. He called it quiet sitting, uh, but it very much was uh, exactly like uh, how meditation worked in Buddhism. He also promoted something, uh, the idea of something called Ali as the great ultimate, uh, this kind of unchanging deeper reality through which everything is interconnected. Uh, and he called it Li, and this pretty much resembles the Tao, uh, which you might remember when we learned about Taoism 
much earlier in this course, we talked about how the Tao is very much like uh, this concept of the Force in Star Wars. So the Li is pretty much the same thing. And all of this brings about uh, a development uh, that we, we refer to as Neo-Confucianism, right? So it's kind of that Confucianism is now evolving into something a bit different uh, in large measure because it's borrowing elements of Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, some Confucian scholars were very critical of this, including Zhu Xi, even though he was actually responsible for this to some degree. Uh, and there's kind of the feeling that, you know, Confucianism was starting to feel more like a religion. Some people felt that was a bad thing. And it wasn't clear whether, you know, is Confucian, Confucianism now more a case of religion serving philosophy or philosophy serving religion? Uh, in any event, though, these developments would eventually uh, become considered legitimate, right? So if you were a Confucian scholar at some point after this, uh, you were really studying Neo-Confucianism, right? So you were not just studying the Confucian classics, but also a lot of the commentaries that were being written at this time uh, that underlie the, this kind of transformation into Neo-Confucianism, which became a really big part of the civil service examinations up until the 20th century. Uh, poetry is still important at this point. Uh, Su Deng Po. Uh, Deng Po is a very important poet of the Northern Song, uh, but he also engaged in other practices, uh, so he was a painter, a calligrapher, uh, and also a Confucian scholar, wrote a lot of uh, commentaries on the Confucian classics, and was a practitioner of the Zen form of Buddhism. Uh, and, you know, again, he was a government official, held a number of posts, though occasionally fell into disfavor, and several times had been forced into exile. Uh, and so we might kind of wrap up by looking at some uh, kind of examples of song art, like one form of art that becomes very, very prevalent at this time is calligraphy. You know, it's kind of this kind of beautification of script where in some ways it's not about what the, the words actually mean, but more about the, the manner in which you depict the letters. Uh, so song calligraphy becomes quite developed during this period. Uh, with song painting, uh, again, we still have landscape painting. Uh, but in connection with developments leading to Neo-Confucianism, uh, the landscapes are a bit more surreal. It's kind of the idea of capturing some kind of inner reality, perhaps corresponding to Lee. Here we see some other examples of song paintings. Uh, in this case, uh, the first two we see uh, actual living things. And one, I'm not even sure whether it's cats or some kind of fluffy dog. Uh, in the middle, we see some individuals, but, but also this kind of surreal landscape in the background. And the third one, uh, you know, more of this just kind of pure landscape painting. But again, uh, drawing your attention to the idea that it's not just uh, that you should be depicting the landscape as the eye sees it, but trying to capture some kind of deeper reality. And probably the extreme of this is going to be Zen painting, right? So... Uh, there, the, the focus is entirely on the inner reality. Uh, and this was something practiced by monks and masters of the Zen, the Zen school. So it's kind of interesting because Zen representing, a, you know, kind of getting back to basics in terms of Buddhism being more of a philosophy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it seems aware of, you know, certain concepts related to Taoist influence about the Li and so forth, this kind of inner reality. Well, that now brings us to the Mongol invasion, uh, something that uh, the whole world is actually being subjected to uh, during this period, right? So the Mongols are going to invade China, but they're also going to be invading the Middle East. They're going to be invading uh, Russia, uh, pretty deep into Eastern Europe and so forth. So who are the Mongols? Uh, well, they're a nomadic people uh, who, uh, prior to the invasion, were living to the north of China. They raised horses and sheep. Uh, were organized into tribes and clans ruled by chiefs, uh, usually individuals who achieved power because they were highly respected, uh, had shown great military prowess and leadership skills. Uh, the language they spoke was uh, not Turkic. It was not part of the kind of family of Turkic languages, but not far off, uh, what we call an Altaic tongue. Uh, and they were polytheistic, believing in many gods, and they had shamans who would commune with the gods and so forth, right? So, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, 
very typical of Central Asia of the steppe region. And then at some point, an individual named Genghis Khan, uh, who was born with the name Temujin. Genghis Khan is the name that was kind of later given to him, uh, kind of title. But in any event, he was able to unite the, the Mongol tribes. Uh, this was really when he was about 40 years of age. Uh, and once he did that, they became this incredibly formidable military force. Uh, the reason he was able to do that was, uh, among other things, he had extraordinary charisma. Um, we should note that many of his uh, leadership abilities would, would pass on to his sons and grandsons. So you actually had kind of three generations in a row of very uh, wise, capable, and talented leaders that allowed the Mongols to expand very rapidly in multiple directions, as indicated by this map, right? Uh, and eventually establishing this vast empire, though we should know, right? I mean, when you expand this rapidly and, and your numbers are relatively small, uh, the nature of your authority is going to be pretty indirect over much of the territory that you conquer. And to some degree, the Mongols will be absorbed by the various different cultures that they bring under their authority. Uh, and eventually then kind of fragmenting in connection with that uh, into different components. So uh, the conquest began, began with Genghis Khan. Uh, there was a brief respite after his death, but in any event, by that point, by 1241, the Mongols had really conquered a tremendous amount of territory uh, in the uh, west, reaching as far as Hungary, Poland, and the shores of the Adriatic Sea. In this image, you can see the Mongols invading Poland. Uh, the only thing that, that kind of prevented them from going further at this point was the news of the Khan's death, at which point the army then had to return to Mongolia to help choose a successor. Uh, but they, they sorted that out pretty quickly, and then the conquests uh, just resumed. In the Middle East, this would actually, uh, in some ways, the Middle East probably took the biggest hit. This would bring an end to the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, the Caliphate was probably uh, by this point, uh, and we're going to learn more about this when we look at developments with respect to Islam, but had become more kind of a symbolic uh, institution, but it did represent kind of the unity of the entire Muslim world. Uh, and so uh, the fact that it came to an end, and by coming to an end, I mean basically the Mongols uh, rounded up not just the Abbasid Caliph, but all his family members, rolled them up in carpets, and trampled them to death with horses. So there was no one who could act as a successor after that. And this was in connection with the siege of Baghdad. All this took place in 1258, which is considered a pretty significant date in the history of the Middle East. Uh, but we'll be coming back to that later. Uh, so as far as what happened in China, uh, the conquest of China began un under Genghis Khan, uh, but would be finished by his successors. So. The year that Genghis Khan died, they, the uh, Mongols took Beijing, which would eventually become the, the capital under, under their rule. And of course, it's the capital today. Uh, and it wasn't until 1241 that they had brought most of northern China under their rule, uh, at which point Chinese advisors were able to convince them that, you know, rather than uh, trying to gain wealth by looting and pillaging, it would be better to establish government uh, and then, uh, you know, generate wealth through taxation. And they went along with it. Now, at this point, the, the most important figure is the grandson of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan. Uh, so it's under him that we're going to see the initiation of Mongol, uh, Mongolian government in China. So first of all, he moves his capital from Mongolia to Beijing. Uh, and so Beijing, now the capital. Uh, and shortly thereafter, right, so from a pretty early point, for the most part, they're going to adopt Chinese administrative practices and pretty much just kind of, you know, you have the, why not? You've just taken over this country that has this really well-developed bureaucracy in place, better to just use it. And by 1271, they had actually adapted, uh, adopted a Chinese dynastic name, the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, and it's pretty much at this point that they then go to war with the Southern Song and finally bring all of China under their control in 1279 when the last Song stronghold falls. So we now have the Yuan dynasty in control of China. Uh, and, and, you know, so for the most part, they're adopting Chinese administrative practices, but they do bring a few things over 
uh, with them from Mongolia. So in some ways, it's kind of a mixture of cultural elements from Mongolia and China. Uh, the capital is now Beijing, and of course, that is the present-day capital of China, uh, which they rebuild as a walled city, but in the Chinese style. Uh, and then they do extend the Grand Canal so that it connects, uh, effectively connecting Beijing economically to the rest of China. Uh, the main point being that you're now able to provide provision for China. So Beijing is now the capital of China, but it will be a segregated city. You have separate walled enclosures for Mongols and Chinese. And this is probably the, the most notable way in which they try to maintain kind of a Mongolian element in their government by kind of keeping uh, native Mongols separate from the Chinese. Uh, we should note also that the palace of the Khan is designed to reflect more uh, his origins in Mongolia. The architect is actually Arab, but is built in the Central Asian style. Uh, and Kublai Khan will maintain a summer palace in Mongolia, in Inner Mongolia, uh, which he calls Xanadu, where, you know, if he feels the need to get back to his semi-nomadic roots, he can go there, engage in hawking and hunting and so forth. So, Yuan government, for the most part, adopting Chinese forms of government and taxation. It is a highly centralized civil administration, so as usual, we have a very large bureaucracy. Uh, the emperor ruling through central, uh, a central secretariat, uh, but also moving secretaries, and this is something a little different. Uh, eventually, so, you know, initially they have these kind of moving secretariats that actually is kind of the government moving from one place to another. But these eventually become rooted uh, in different provinces and become provincial governments. Now, they do try to make sure that the Mongols maintain, you know, some degree of uh, separation and control. The military is monopolized by the Mongols, uh, and they bring with them nomadic allies uh, who will in the, collectively will have kind of control of the military, uh, and they try to remain separate from the Chinese people, uh, and they ensure that military officers should rank above civil officers, uh, uh, officials, right? So that's probably one really distinct difference uh, in terms of Yuan government from previous Chinese dynasties. Uh, related to this, they maintain a kind of ethnic classification. Top civil and military posts go to Mongols. Uh, but then after that, it's fine, it's not, it's not even the Chinese that come after the Mongols. After that, you have Persians and Turks and other non-Chinese people who have the highest civil posts. Uh, below the Mongols. Uh, when you finally get to native Chinese, they make sure that northern Chinese people rank above southern Chinese people, right? So this is all kind of designed uh, simply to kind of protect the Mongols' position at the top of the kind of political hierarchy. Uh, they do revive the examination system in 1315, uh, but they make sure that Mongols and their allies get easier examinations uh, in order to ensure that there are a sufficient number of them who actually make it into the administration. They have kind of a quota for that, uh, to make sure that their numbers are never less than indigenous Chinese. Now, one really positive development is the Mongol Empire kind of reestablishes contacts with other higher civilizations, not least along the Silk Road, right? So, you know, now that the Mongols are in control of most parts of the world, uh, you know, Whatever barrier had been created by the uh, advent of Islamic civilizations removed. Uh, and so we see a lot of Arabs engaging in trade with China, even the development of Arab communities in the port cities. Uh, the camel caravans are now carrying silks and ceramics as far away as Western Asia and Moscow. In connection with this, this is actually the kind of uh, channel through which printing and gunpowder eventually spread. Uh, but also knowledge of China in connection with this. And uh, this leads one Venetian merchant named Marco Polo uh, to actually travel to China to find out what it's all about. Uh, though I should note, some historians uh, suspect that he might have plagiarized some other travelers. It's not even clear that he made it all the way to China, though he claimed to have served Kublai Khan as an official uh, between 1275 and 1292. Uh, but again, there's a lot of controversy over the reliability of his accounts and whether he's 
you know, maybe making up a few things or borrowing the accounts of other individuals that were actually true. Uh, this also is going to be a period that sees the spread of other religions coming from the outside because the Mongols are very tolerant in this regard. So we're going to see the spread of Nestorian Christianity. It's a very kind of specific sect of Christianity that is spreading from Persia to Central Asia and then eventually entering China. Uh, at some point, they're even going to invite uh, the papacy uh, to send missions uh, to the Mongol court. Uh, and so we're going to see the Vatican actually establish an archbishopric in Beijing at some point. Uh, but, but they're tolerant of other religions as well. So uh, they themselves kind of prefer Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but they certainly don't get in the way of the Chinese strand of Buddhism, which flourishes during this period. And finally, Islam is also going to make headway, uh, particularly in Central Asia and Western China, uh, where it becomes permanently established. So uh, today in Western China, uh, Islam is the dominant religion. Uh, and and they're, they're quite fine with Confucianism, which they regard as just being another religion, uh, meaning, for instance, that its teachers are exempted from paying taxes. Uh, so they're, they're pretty much, you know, kind of a live and let live attitude as far as religion goes. Ultimately, the Mongols are going to have a very limited influence on Chinese culture. And part of this reflects that from the Chinese point of view, they're pretty much barbarians. The Chinese feel they have little to learn, uh, well, from pretty much any other area, but certainly not from the Mongols. Uh, and so, you know, in as much as the Mongols become dominant in the north, the centers of Chinese culture now move to the south, uh, partly as a way of kind of resisting outside influences. And so related to this, Chinese culture is actually becoming more conservative and turning more inward, uh, which is somewhat ironic given that the Mongols themselves are pretty open to outside influences. So probably the, the one significant cultural development from the Yuan period is drama. Uh, so we see the development of what comes to be known as Yuan drama. It consists of operatic performances, usually that have happy endings uh, and have a certain kind of element of vaudeville theater, you know, this kind of bit, bit of a kind of very physical, comedic kind of acting uh, combined with poetic arias, right? Arias are these kind of, you know, songs we usually associate with European opera. Uh, very often, very few stage props, right? So you conveyed... Uh, like what was happening through makeup, through costumes, through pantomime, kind of, you know, the acting out physically uh, of different actions, you know, these very, very pronounced stylized gestures. Um, and except for the arias, the dramas pretty much use the kind of day-to-day -day spoken Chinese. The arias would have been kind of a uh, Chinese of a higher form. Uh, and eventually, Yuan drama is going to merge with Southern Chinese theatrical traditions in the 19th century to become today's Beijing opera, right? So in, in that one regard, uh, Yuan influence lives on. So uh, kind of wrapping up our consideration of developments in China, we should note that it, at some point, the mandate of heaven passes away from the Yuan dynasty. Uh, so the various khanates that have been created by the Mongols, uh, you know, in the Middle East, in Europe, Central Asia, and so forth, uh, increasingly became separated from one another, uh, not just in terms of distance, but also in terms of religion and culture, each one kind of adopting whatever was on the ground when they got there. Uh, as far as China goes, the court in Beijing really never gained legitimacy in the eyes of most Chinese. Uh, which, you know, particularly when they started then to, uh, to raise taxation, uh, so taxes became more burdensome. When you started to have a kind of growing uh, problem of corruption, uh, you know, that, that just kind of confirmed uh, for many Chinese everything they, they believed to be wrong with the Yuan dynasty. Uh, the end, though, really kind of came after a series of natural disasters, including one that saw the Yellow River completely rerouted. Uh, and then finally, a rebel army rose up against the Mongol emperor, uh, who, with his court, fled to Mongolia. And that's pretty much where we're going to stop with China in this course. We kind of pick up the thread in History 116, but we won't be looking at China again in this course. Uh, and so let us conclude here.